The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and smeared the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is. But others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He replied, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes and I washed and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. They asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Christ, he would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, He is of age, question him. So a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, If he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him and said, You are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, This is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, You were born totally in sin, and are you trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see might see. And those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, 
you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. So this uh, Sunday, this fourth Sunday uh, of Lent, we have this uh, color that I'm wearing in addition to that, but uh, we have John chapter 9, uh, first uh, verse through 40, the first, 40, first, first 41 verse, excuse me, still getting my brain to connect with my mouth this morning. So uh, we have this uh, gospel of the man born blind, and there's an interplay between uh, seeing and not seeing blindness, uh, light, life, all those things are all wrapped up together here. Uh, There's a metaphorical use of the term blind, which is a refusal to understand, a refusal to accept, which is uh, very commonly used throughout the Gospels, throughout even uh, the Old Testament as well. Uh, Blind being you're blind, you're blind because you refuse to accept what you're seeing, what you are, what is right before you, you refuse to accept or understand, not that you have physical blindness, Although in this case, with the man born blind, there's definitely a case of physical blindness. Uh, The physical blindness, you you read it often, blind. Uh, Luke even says in in his gospel, you know, that he came to open the eyes of the blind, and that's a prophecy from Isaiah, but uh, even then he came to bestow sight on those who were blind. Even then it's used more often as a metaphorical vision. And not so much as uh, a, uh, a physical healing of the blind, although those did occur too. It's both, okay, throughout the Gospels and uh, the life of Jesus. So um, here we have another carefully constructed drama. And of course, we're celebrating the scrutiny today uh, for uh, one of the elects. Uh, the other two were, um, you know, as I said in the Bolton article, uh, we took care of the other two earlier. So we have one uh, scrutiny or uh, elect for a uh, the scrutiny for one elect today, which we're going to take care of after the homily. Uh, so these gospel readings are uh, around conversion. That's why we do these for the RCIA. So similar to last week's woman at the well, all right, this story of the man born blind is also this carefully constructed drama with several scenes building to a decisive climax of becoming Jesus' disciple by way of encounter with him. This is the whole purpose is that when people are being converted or when they start to meet Jesus or when Jesus reveals them, himself to them, they have a conversion. They start to follow Jesus more. They become his disciple. So the woman at the well from last week, she grew in faith as she conversed with Jesus, leading to a true understanding of his identity. She then called called others to encounter him for themselves, becoming an evangelist too. And so this gospel of the man born blind similarly describes a developing faith in Jesus, leading him to discipleship and evangelism, which is made clear by his repetitive telling of others of what Jesus did for him. It's three times he tells Uh, the people, what uh, he did, what Jesus did for them. This is evangelism. This is what we're called to do. We're called to reconcile um, uh, our our, uh, lost or wayward brothers and sisters with the church as well. That's what you're going to hear with the story of the prodigal son at the 11 o'clock and 5.30 masses. So you have to come back if you want to hear that. All right, but so who's, so uh, this is a good question anyway. Whose sin is it that caused the man to be born blind? So the assumption here is that someone's sin because somebody's not developed right. That's the way they understood things. And so then this is a, a, a popular question. Uh, it gets to the mystery of suffering, which I'm going to address. Uh, but you, you could look at this whole gospel, and there's all kinds of different points to really hone in on and focus on. They all have these different meanings in there. Uh, but we're going to try to kind of conflate this, if you will, to something a little bit smaller. So um, whose sin is it that caused the man to be born blind? Uh, it's a well-debated controversy, among Jewish scholars, uh, it was whether or not unborn babies in the womb could sin and therefore suffer consequences such as blindness or lameness or other birth defects. So the disciples, they were aware of this debate and they asked Jesus to comment on this controversy, uh, which we will just call, uh, we know it as the mystery of suffering. Okay, we just know it as the mystery of suffering. Uh, and, and this is, the, of course, uh, the mystery of suffering is why do these things happen? Well, Jesus' basic answer is that suffering is an occasion for God to show his glory and purposes. He says, so that the works of God might be made visible through him. That's why he was born blind. 
so that the works of God might be made visible through him. So, uh, so this is something that we all experience as suffering, and sometimes we don't know how to react to it, or oftentimes we get caught up in the drama of the suffering, and we really uh, kind of get out of control. And so it's good to look at what the scriptures might say about suffering. Uh, in the scripture, we can find five different reasons for suffering. So first of all, uh, suffering as a proving or a testing of our faith. Uh, we put it in those terms. In our words, suffering is permitted so that we may grow our, in our faith or persevere uh, in our faith. And so then there's a second reason for suffering. Uh, suffering is meant for our enlightenment or learning. What's the lesson in the suffering? Am I suffering because of a decision I made? And so there's suffering involved there. What's the lesson? Uh, so there's something to be learned, enlightenment. Uh, the third reason for suffering is it's a natural consequence for sin. Okay, like um, gravity. It's a natural consequence for jumping off rooftops. You're going to fall 9.81 meters per second squared to the earth, okay? So some, some numbers still stick in my mind. The acceleration uh, due to gravity. So uh, you're going to fall or 32.2 feet per second squared, okay? If you want in English. <laughs> so, so you're going to fall that fast towards the earth. So it's suffering as a natural consequence for sin. There are natural consequences for sin. Uh, Again, one, two, three, fourth. The fourth one, uh, suffering that shows forth God's glory. And again, who knows God's plans, in other words? Uh, so we endure all kinds of sufferings, of course, and uh, the question is, well, we don't know why God has allowed this. There must be a greater purpose. What would be God's plans in this? And so that's another reason. And fifthly, uh, suffering due to bearing witness to Christ. Okay, so suffering for the truth. Right? They're suffering for the truth. So we find these different reasons in the scripture, uh, these understandings of suffering. Uh, so God does not allow anything into our lives, though, that is not able to glorify him, uh, while at the same time drawing us into deeper friendship or union with him. So God does not allow anything into our lives that will overcome us. He will never allow anything into our lives that it will be greater than what we can sustain by his grace. And so that's something that we can look forward to whenever we endure suffering. We're never going to be overcome by what God allows us to endure. And so then in the midst of our sufferings, clinging to self and our comforts, they build resentment. But trusting in God's goodness and providence, that brings us peace. Okay? And this is always difficult to do when we're in the midst of suffering is to learn how to embrace or accept it. And if I can do that, I'm going to be at peace with it. But if I keep trying to push back on it, I'm going to resent it. And then, then I'm not going to be at peace. And there's, again, there's this mystery about this suffering. And so suffering is not God's direct will, but it's permitted by God. And it is what we must live with as we learn to deal with the mess of disorder that we have created in our rebellion against God and his rule over us. Okay, truth be told, we rebel against God. We're all sinners. We rebel against God at some point, sometime in our lives. We push back on God. We push back on his will, okay? And that creates a disorder, okay? If we could easily submit to God and his will, we would have a lot less suffering, a lot less, not, not be completely without it. And, of course, um, we would be much more at peace. But in the end, suffering leads to eternal glory as the cross makes clear, right? Jesus has suffered tremendously to make up for our sins uh, for us, out of love for us, and that led to glory. Eventually, it does not end with death. Death does not get the last word. The glory of Jesus Christ does, and that's what awaits all of us through the resurrection. Now, note that the healing of the blindness was not complete. There's something else going on here we need to take note of. The healing of the blindness was not complete until he did what? Until he obeyed Jesus' command to go wash, illustrating for us that obedience is the first stage of authentic discipleship. Jesus always invites us to follow him, but he never tells us what to expect. Okay, that's because that's the nature of faith, all right? And so he had to go wash. He had to obey Jesus' command. He spit on the ground and put clay on his eyes. How is that going to heal me? Don't ask questions. Just obey. Go wash, okay? And he had to obey first. He probably would have never got healed from his blindness if he didn't obey. He just had we walked around with clay and spit on his eyes, right? Okay, so, so he had to obey 
that command. He doesn't understand it. I mean, who's gonna, really, how are you going to heal me in blindness from putting dirt on my eyes? Okay? And I, just don't ask questions. That's not how God works all the time. His logic is not like ours, not as God sees, does, uh, does man see from the first reading, right? So as the story continues, the blind man, now able to see, experiences a deepening understanding of Jesus as more than just a prophet. He first said he was a prophet, then he's coming to see him as something else. Uh, Lord, Jesus continues to call this once blind man to, to faith by asking him, do you believe in the Son of Man? All right, so here comes Jesus, and he's escalating that belief in him. He's making him grow in faith. Belief or faith is not merely an intellectual assent to a proposition. We have to grab onto this, what faith really is. I mean, faith revealed in the religion, then there's that, our personal belief in faith. How strongly do we believe that Jesus helps us, and do we live that way? So belief or faith is not merely an intellectual assent to a proposition, but it's an attachment of trust to a person, the person of Jesus, as the one who comes from God. Are we attached to the person of Jesus? Do we attach ourselves to the Lord, that, he is, that I cling to him for my every single uh, activity of life? Do I depend upon him? All right, a lot of us don't still. Right? We still rely on ourselves. We have this tendency to be self-reliant, almost too self-reliant, especially our American independence. We, we love our self-reliance. Like when it comes to Jesus, though, it's like we need to cling to him for every single source of our lives. So the man, he believes Jesus to be a prophet, but faith, if it's real, will, will require the man to accept Jesus on Jesus' own terms, since faith requires also this humble acceptance, to follow without knowing where you are going. That always makes us uncomfortable. All right, especially in American culture, we don't like to not know what we're doing or why we're, why we're doing this. We want to know what we're, what, do, what we're doing and why we're doing it. We want to know where we're going. So, but that's not discipleship. It's not the nature of faith. So the man has moved, though. He's moved from knowledge of Jesus' name, that's verse 11, to confession of him as a prophet in verse 17, to bearing witness that Jesus is the one come from God in verse 33, to accepting his claim to be the Son of Man in verses 35 through 38. So even if the man does not understand the full significance of his confession and worship of Jesus, he is accepting Jesus on Jesus' own terms. He may not understand, but he still accepts him for what Jesus says. So it places himself in a position to receive deeper revelation of and friendship or union with Jesus. How do we gain that? How do we get deeper revelation of Jesus or greater friendship with Jesus? It, we, we accept Jesus on his terms. We stop trying to make up the religion. We stop trying to pick and choose. Right, here's what Jesus says. Let's just follow that. All right, if we can do that, we're going to deepen our relationship. He's going to reveal himself more to us. Okay, so then note that uh, none of the disciples have understood with any real depth the identity of Jesus or the nature of the salvation he brings. Okay, so here's Jesus again catechizing a particular person in the Gospels, while the disciples are still kind of like, hey, what are we, when, when are we eating next, you know? <laughs> so, you know, they're, they're still not grabbing on to what Jesus' mission is. So that all gets revealed to them later on, and they start to put all piece, puzzle pieces together in the uh, revelation of those resurrection appearances. Now, in contrast, uh, there's, uh, in contrast to discipleship, there's the Pharisees, and there's another group, the Jews, but the Pharisees, uh, they move from debate and division in verse 16 to judgment in verse 24, and on to expulsion of one who would be a disciple of Jesus in verse 34. Then they throw him out. You know, that's a very big deal when they say throw him out of the synagogue. You're not just getting thrown out of the building. It's like they're cutting you off from the whole community. You have no other connections, and that was a really big deal. All right, so you like, literally, your life is like, all your sources of, of life in the world, so to speak, would be cut off. Now, when Jesus, the light shines, judgment occurs. Okay, for the same sun that melts wax also hardens the clay. Okay, so Jesus has equal contact with all. Opponents of Jesus, they have hard hearts. They reject God's offers of mercy and his call to repentance that happens to come through suffering. Okay, so it happens to come through suffering. Such hardness of heart darkens their minds and alienates them from God. The sight they think they have must be taken from them to receive true sight, to see the true light who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
Okay, so you start putting all these things together in the metaphorical versus the physical. Okay, there's, there's more of a metaphor. For the Pharisees and this group of the Jews, they have a blindness. They physically see, but they refuse to accept. They refuse to accept what Jesus has revealed about himself. In the end, the spiritual blindness is the real sin or the metaphorical refusal to believe. I'm choosing not to believe. I'm choosing not to accept what I see before me. I'm choosing not to accept you as the son of God. You cannot be the Messiah. This man is a sinner. How can he do these things though? He would never be, see they, they have their own logic. They're so sure about themselves. In the end, the spiritual blindness or that metaphorical blindness is the real sin. It's a closed offness, if you will. We're being closed off. They're closed off from opening themselves up to what may be before them. Uh, just like the same mistake in the first reading. How many sons did they have to go through? Not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. Nine sons of Jesse. None of these. Even the prophet got it wrong who was doing the anointing. Surely this must be him. Surely this one. Surely, th Lord, surely this one. Surely this one. Eight times. Surely, Lord, this is the one. Eight times you got it wrong. Uh, do you have any more sons? There's got to be one more. It's, so, something else is going on. Okay, finally, he gets to the, to the right one. So in the end, this, again, the spiritual blindness is the real sin, not the physical blindness. An accidental physical blindness is preferred. It's better to be physically blind than metaphorically spiritually blind. Okay, so the willful spiritual blindness, that constitutes this refusal to believe in Jesus for who he truly is. Okay, so every one of us is born spiritually blind. Okay, and we are in need of enlightenment. Baptism is a form of enlightenment and enables us to see clearly at first. Afterward, our sight becomes cloudy and our relationship with God and others have blind spots due to our refusal to acknowledge our blindness. Where do our problems in our relationships come from? Blindness, a metaphorical blindness. We're refusing to acknowledge our own blindness or lack of recognition of our poverty and our need for God. If we lack recognition of our poverty and our need for God, suffering fixes that. It's a quick fix. Suffering always reveals to us how much we need God. Okay, so regarding the suffering then, uh, have we rejected the evidence of our own experience due to a faulty understanding of God or his ways as the Pharisees may have? Do we think we have God all figured out which causes our blindness? And maybe we are not totally blind and we do see partially, but when there is suffering in our lives, do we know for what reason or purpose? Is God doing something in our lives that we still do not fully recognize? If he is, then you can be certain that it is for his glory and ours.